Okay, good morning everyone. Hello and welcome to the Landscape Conservation Design webinar series hosted by the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative and the University of Arizona School of Natural Resources and the Environment. Uh, this is Ashwin Naidu. Uh, I'm a assistant research scientist at the University of Arizona uh, working with the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative. Um, I'm your meeting host today. Uh, this webinar series will provide a learning opportunity for desert LCC partners interested in landscape scale conservation. Webinar series, uh, webinars in this series will highlight key components of landscape conservation design from prominent regional and national examples. These examples offer insights and lessons applicable to the three ongoing landscape conservation design efforts of the desert LCC. Uh, these are the Eastern Mojave, Madrian Watersheds, and Dos Rios. We are very pleased to have Tom Mewald doing a presentation with us today. Tom is the landscape conservation planner for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, in, he's based out of Portland, Oregon. Uh, Tom works with multiple programs of the Fish and Wildlife Service, including the Science Application Program, the North Pacific LCC, and the National Wildlife Refuge System. Currently, Tom is the project manager for the Pacific Northwest Coast LCD, as well as engaged in several other regional conservation planning efforts in the Northwest. Tom's academic background is in landscape ecology, planning, and spatial technology. Prior to his work with the Fish and Wildlife Service, Tom was a conservation planner for and international salmon conservation NGO managed several regional vegetation and land cover mapping efforts and created a GIS lab in Central Africa. So we're very pleased to have Tom today presenting um, this talk on making, land, making data relevant for landscape conservation design. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today and thank you Tom for sharing your work with us. And I'm now going to turn it over to Tom. Okay. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Ashwood, and thanks to Genevieve Johnson as well for uh, uh, inviting me to talk here. And so Ashwin asked me to talk about uh, you know something related to data and information and and uh, and landscape conservation design. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about something that kind of occupies a lot of my time and and mental space is. Uh, is how to make data uh, relevant and meaningful in a landscape conservation design uh, effort. So um, let's see. Uh, first of all, I want to acknowledge a bunch of people that I have uh, worked with over the past few years in the Pacific Northwest and, and beyond, and uh, in no particular order other than the order of uh, which I stole their slides that they uh, lent me to, to incorporate in my presentation. So uh, just kudos to everybody who, uh, who has helped uh, think through some of these, these challenges uh, in making information and data relevant and, and landscape conservation design. So a quick overview of what I'm going to talk about um, first is, uh, you know, uh, hopefully I'm going to build off of the, the other speakers in the series, uh, Rua, Mordecai, and then Rob Campoloni and talk about, you know, landscape conservation design. Um, I, I, I understand that um, that Rob gave a presentation on kind of the overview and, and how not to do a landscape conservation design and, and probably introduced uh, to, to you a, a framework. So I'm going to kind of build off of that. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the work that we're doing. Uh, uh, initially, when Ashwin asked me to give this talk, I, I was really interested in this concept of uh, using the open standards for conservation and making them more uh, spatially, uh, uh, I guess, Spatially engaged uh, and, and uh, potentials for incorporation with landscape conservation design. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some barriers and challenges uh, and some potential solutions in using data. I feel like over the past you know five six years we've tried a lot of things. Some have worked. Some have blatantly not worked. And so uh, if there's anything I can do to impart some uh, some some of our experience to to you folks uh, in the desert and beyond, that that would that would be my goal here. And then um, start to talk about um, the work we're doing in the landscape conservation design that we're starting in the Pacific Northwest Coast. So that's kind of a, an overview. And as I started thinking about uh, this topic, um, you know, I, I guess I wanted to uh, kind of have 
uh, some core elements or some core thoughts around which to develop this presentation. And by the way, this is the first time I've given this presentation. I kind of developed this to for the Desert LCC and also because I think this will um, fit some of our needs in the Pacific Northwest Coast as well. But really, you know, kind of one of the main things that I've, I've found is that data are, you know, let's not confuse the, the, the means and the ends. The end goal of landscape conservation design is to develop landscape scale strategies with collaborative partnerships um, and data is a medium to get there. Um, and let's kind of keep that in mind. I've seen some efforts and some processes that I've been engaged with. I'm, I'm a bit of a data wonk myself, so I, I tend to, uh, you know, get really interested in data, but I've seen, you know, kind of data expand beyond kind of the, the scope and, and maybe not necessarily meet that, that end goal of, uh, you know, getting people together around maps to, to identify strategies. Um, and so data needs a structure to reach that goal. I don't know if it's data or it's people need a structure. We need a structure. People and data need some sort of structure to reach that goal. And, and, and I think that's where the open standards can be a, an avenue for that. It's definitely not the only, but I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, about that. So. Um, you know, data is a big concept. What is data? What do we mean by data? And uh, so going into this presentation, let's kind of clarify that. Uh, there's a whole, you know, Venn diagram overlap with the concept of data management. I'm not going to touch on data management so much, you know, like the whole data management life cycle and, you know, uh, archiving data and, and making data accessible uh, uh, via, uh, uh, you know, ArcGIS online or, or, or ScienceBase or some of these other tools. I'm not going to go there. Uh, I think there's some people in the LCC network that would be great to, to give that presentation. I'm uh, not necessarily that person. Um, and then decision support tools, you know, things that you do with data, you know, crunch uh, tools to crunch data and analyze data. Um, I'm going to kind of touch on that. I think that plays a role in the whole conversation. But really, I'm, I'm focused on, you know, how to make data relevant uh, to the, the design process. And I'm really focused on spatial data. And, you know, don't get me started on, on social uh, data because I'm going through all sorts of uh, issues with getting a, a social network survey out to the public via the federal government. There's a whole set of challenges um, with uh, acquiring social uh, data, economic data, and things like that. I'm really focused on, on spatial data because, you know, we're dealing with a landscape, uh, and a landscape is, is a bit of an abstract concept, and you need uh, spatial representations of that concept to, in order to, to get people uh, uh, engaged. So, you know, how do we make data relevant for landscape conservation design is kind of what I'm going to get at here. And so what is landscape conservation design? And I will let your eyes kind of uh, look over and glaze over these definitions. These are great, awesome definitions created by a, a few different efforts that are out there. I'm going, to, I'm going to boil this down into something very simple for the purpose of, of this uh, conversation. So landscape conservation design is bringing people in a region together around maps to impact things we care about. Um, and just a very basic, you know, kind of plain speak uh, definition of landscape conservation design. And when I talk about maps, I'm talking about data. Data equals maps equals models and maps are, and data is just a way to model uh, the real world, and maps are just a, a, a model of the of the real world as well. So they're all kind of, uh, you know, those kind of definitions are, are intertwined. Um, so it, this is a very powerful concept, though, and this is what landscape conservation design is about. It's about bringing people together around maps, and I've been engaged in these processes um, basically throughout throughout the world. Um, and you you find this kind of general you know people like to look at maps and think about what to do on the landscape. So really, let's not uh, let's not get too uh, lost in technical details when we start talking about data. Let's think about the end goal of getting people together around maps to make decisions uh, about uh, the area. The above is uh, the Pacific Northwest Coast in Hokkaido, Japan. We developed a landscape conservation design for uh, watersheds in uh, in Japan to identify and, and protect the, uh, some of the last uh, wild rivers in Japan. And we use data as a way to get there, we, to engage people. Around a pool, table, a, a pool table in the Columbia Plateau, we spent a couple days with state, uh, local, uh, federal partners to, to look at information and data to support what we want to do and, and strategies on the landscape. It takes a lot of, inf you know, kind of a lot of debate uh, with scientists. There's sagegrass experts here. There's ecologists. There's managers trying to understand what the maps mean, and having that, that space uh, to bring people around and, and, and figure out what to do on the landscape. 
And then in California as well, you know, people, uh, this, uh, this scenario of bringing people together around maps is, uh, will continue to play out regardless of politics, regardless of, uh, of anything. This is what humans do. Uh, so this is kind of what landscape conservation design is. And kind of drilling into uh, landscape conservation design I, um, and building off of Rob's presentation from the last uh, uh, um, webinar in the webinar series, uh, landscape conservation design and the ICAS platform. And I'm going to talk briefly about this. Hopefully you saw Rob's presentation. If not, I, uh, it was an excellent presentation, and I refer people to look at that to get you know kind of more input. This is a, a, a manuscript that will be developed, and uh, it has been developed. It's, uh, uh, it's going to go out in press here uh, shortly. Uh, stay tuned. Uh, but basically, the, the concept be behind ICAST, and I'm just going to show this diagram that, that represents the main components. One of the fundamental uh, aspects of, of, of this platform is innovation. And I think there is so much room for uh, innovation around landscape scale data there is a uh, you know there's a, a fire hose of data coming at us the conservation community the natural resource management community every day so we need to think about you know innovative ways of you know how to take this information and, and transform it into meaningful knowledge and and strategies and I, I think ICAS is one of those things that gets there through convening stakeholders to identify what's important on the landscape uh, this is where the data comes in, assessing landscape conditions. Um, again, data is a part of spatial design, uh, identifying those priority places on the landscape to meet goals and objectives for uh, multiple uh, targets. And then, uh, you know, the endpoint that I was talking about earlier is, is really that strategy design, getting people to identify, self-identify, you know, how are we going to collectively do something like landscape connectivity? How, you know, what is the role of different agencies and organizations to meet uh, connectivity? So getting at strategies. So there's, you know, kind of a, uh, there's, uh, if you look at this diagram, I really like it in many ways. One, because it, it you know, has these puzzle pieces that bring uh, th these kind of disparate aspects of conservation design together. And at the bottom we have, you know, kind of the more of the data world. This is where data is, and this is where uh, you know, up here is where, um, uh, you know, kind of the, the strategy development and convening people to identify what to do on the landscape. And so there's a real balance there. And not to get all new agey or anything, but, you know, it's almost like a, a yin and yang of these two different, uh, you know, finding balance between strategies and the data world is a really important part of having a good uh, landscape conservation design effort. You don't want to get to this point where you have a lot of data collected and you don't have the strategies uh, or the convening and um, functions of, of landscape conservation design together. I think, you know, you know even Craig Groves uh, in his presentation that he gave to us a, a while ago, and I'll just impart uh, this knowledge, is that, you know, one of the biggest uh, set or uh, drawbacks of conservation planning in the past has been this focus on assessment and data and information and not so much on the strategies and, and convening. So finding that balance between the two is, uh, I think, is, is really important uh, and a, a setting uh, a stage that you should think about uh, landscape conservation design as a balance between those two elements. Um, so going on in my presentation, I'm going to be talking about a, a number of different efforts in the Pacific Northwest that I've been engaged with at various levels. Uh, and I'm going to bring up these uh, uh, case studies along the way. So just so that you're, you're calibrated uh, to, to where this is in the world, uh, Columbia Plateau is going to be one. This is the uh, kind of sagebrush uh, shrublands of eastern Washington and Oregon. The Northwest Basin and Range, um, I guess, you know, this is almost desert uh, getting down there. This is definitely very arid land um, uh, with uh, a lot of sage step. And then uh, definitely a more a music environment up here in the Pacific Northwest Coast uh, where we're uh, starting to kick off a, a landscape conservation design effort. So. Just so you're calibrated, as I as I go through some case studies and examples of where these places are in the in the world. So let's uh, let's have a, a little uh, theory of change of you know how data uh, should work. You know you you develop a bunch of zeros and ones on a map. Um, you know hopefully that turns into you know what we call information. That's something that people can can use, and that information then becomes knowledge uh, that people understand, and they. Like, oh, yes, I, this is what we do. And th that turns into strategies. And strategies actually turns to um, on-the-ground impact. So that's, you know, that's a, that's a really great theory. And um, 
I don't know if I've, I know I've seen a, you know, a lot of data be produced that kind of ends at the data stage. It's data that's produced as phase ones and zeros, as far as I know. It doesn't really get to that, uh, that strategy stage. And I guess that's where I want to bring up uh, you know, the, the role of the open standards um, in making data and information relevant to landscape conservation design. Uh, but first, I'm going to make the link between LCD processes and potential data processes. Um, so there's, I'm classifying uh, the, the uh, kind of the assessment and the, and the science data world of landscape conservation design into assessment of current condition. There's probably multiple ways to do this. Assessment of future condition, um, identifica identification of priority areas or spatial design, and then uh, strategy mapping. So these are kind of four you know, distinct kind of workflows, if you will, or, or things that lead to products and, uh, and information that, that is hopefully you know, goes down that chain to, uh, from knowledge to, to strategies to impact. Um, so I think that the first thing to, uh, to keep in mind is that you know, the first thing to, of making data relevant is that first as you start the LCD that you articulate a vision. Um, for example, this is in the northwest coast of achieving a network of healthy connected ecosystems and working landscapes. I'm not going to read the rest. We've identified a suite of fundamental objectives. These are things that we want this project, this landscape conservation design to do. Um, so always having those in mind as you think about data and articulating those clearly first and, and doing it collaboratively. We spent a year uh, with a group of, of stakeholders to, to get to this point. Um, and then the next thing that we've done is a, a series of polls uh, and, and outreach efforts to really identify what people want. So this is that, that, uh, the outcome of a, of a poll that we sent out of basically asking people what kind of information or data would you like to have, what is very important, what is important, and what is somewhat important, what is important maybe for later iterations of the, uh, of the landscape conservation design effort. So prioritization of strategies uh, came out as, as number one. That's what people want. Uh, they want to get to strategies. They don't, don't just want data and information without that link to strategies. Uh, people are in, interested in changing environments, past and current condition, and, and connectivity zones are kind of some of the, the, the hot topics that we're facing in the, in the Pacific Coast. So we want to make our data and information uh, planning as we as we start this project, uh, relevant for those needs, and so I, I guess that would be a, a you know a two fundamental you know one fundamental thing is is articulating these things first. Um, you know, let's move on to kind of the next uh, layer of you know making data relevant. Uh, again, bringing up this this very simple definition, bringing people together around maps to impact things we care about. So, what are things that we care about? Uh, in the parlance of uh, uh, conservation planning and, and the open standards, it's an element of biodiversity, or it could be a, uh, I'm going to throw in there, a human well-being target. It could be an ecosystem service at a project site, which could be a large landscape, uh, which can be a species habitat ecological system that the, chose, the project has chosen to focus on. And as we start getting into, um, you know, getting into data and information about those targets, we find that there's a whole bunch of different kinds of targets. There's kind of the broad coarse filter targets, and there's kind of intermediate filter targets, you know, maybe ecological systems or, or mappable elements. Uh, there's fine filter targets of uh, threatened and endangered species. We have um, other species-based targets. So, for example, we talk a lot about uh, mapping uh, a representative uh, focal or surrogate species, uh, use the term that you want that represent particular habitat types um, and, and developing models that show where the hotspots for those, those surrogate species, if you will, are. Um, and we talk about human well-being targets. Where are the you know, clean water sources? Where are the uh, uh, agricultural uh, productivity lands that we can find some co-benefit with conservation? So you know, there's different kinds of conservation targets out there, and they all have different uh, um, requirements for information and data. I think that uh, kind of what I want to get at here and, and, and a key point is to identify uh, mappable key ecological attributes of those conservation targets. And that's really where, uh, you know, I'm going to start talking about the open standards because we're really getting into open standards uh, 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 words here when I start talking about targets and key ecological attributes. So, I'm, you know, I'm not going to uh, talk in depth about the open standards if you're interested. 
I suggest uh, going to the, the website, Simple Google uh, of Open Standards for the Practice of Conservation. We'll get you there. Um, it's a widely adopted uh, approach, uh, first by the NGOs, now federal agencies, uh, state agencies, foundations are using the open standards as a way to conceptualize uh, a conservation effort, to plan actions. Um, uh, and really, there's a strong focus on outcome-oriented thinking and uh, developing theories of change that get us from, you know, where we are now to a, a, a state of, of conservation or restoration or, or um, whatever other strategy there is. Um, so it, it has that nice link of conceptualizing, uh, you know, looking at conservation targets, looking at key ecological attributes, um, and uh, it's, it's quite adaptive as well. Uh, the framework is, is supposed to be relevant at any scale. However, uh, you know, you really, uh, there is kind of some, some baggage with the open standards in terms of, it was really developed for site-specific uh, type endeavors. And a lot of the, 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 I think the approaches are relevant for landscape scale. For example, if you're looking at a, at a wildlife refuge on the coast, um, you know, maybe 20,000 acre wildlife refuge, you know, conceivably, this is something that a biologist or a, or a wildlife manager can, can drive around the refuge uh, in a day and get a sense of, you know, the condition. And he knows there's a lot of expert knowledge uh, in, in this kind of scale where, you know, the, the people who work there know the, the condition of the landscape. Once you get to a broad region and a landscape like this, it becomes very different. And there's no one person who can you know, has the, the knowledge of that. That's where you really need data and information to, to support understanding the condition and the threats at the landscape scale. Um, so as we start talking about, you know, what is a key ecological attribute? Um, and I'm going to use a, an analogy for, um, developed by Nick Solasky from Foundations of Success um, uh, around uh, a, a, a automobile. So uh, you, if you think about your car, you know, like my Subaru, uh, it's a stick shift. Um, it has a gas gauge. It's really useful information. It's, it's broken up into these increments of, okay, I know when it's full. I, I'm doing good. When, I'm, when I start getting down here, I'm like, okay, I need a strategy. I need a different strategy to get, uh, or else I'm not going to get from point A to point B, literally. Um, there's an information need. There's an actual measurement. And there's interpretive markings to trigger the action. So this is a this is a good key attribute I want on my dashboard. I want to know what's going on in my car so I don't uh, get out, run out of gas. Um, kind of the example that, that is brought up is the tachometer. As um, it's kind of useful in my stick shift and my wife's Subaru. It doesn't, it's an automatic and um, it really doesn't provide a whole lot of great information. It, it tells me how many rotations uh, you know per per uh, minute my my car has, but it's it's not really, if I had to choose between a gas gauge and a tachometer, I would, I would go with a gas gauge in terms of, of something I want to monitor and measure uh, that, that's, that's relevant to, uh, to uh, what I'm doing. So the same is true for landscape conservation design. We want to identify those things and those, those markings along the way that tell us that we, uh, we are in need of a different strategy. And so the, the open standards provides that. Um, you identify your target. For example, a sage shrub step is, is articulated here. Uh, let's skip over the category for now. It's, it's a little too much information. The key ecological attribute is the departure from normal fire regime. That's in, important information that you want to know for managing uh, sage step or for identifying important areas for, uh, for protection or restoration or, or, or some strategy. And there's a, a data set. There's a land fire uh, FRCC data set that's out there. It's uh, the, the quality is uh, probably, you know, there, we could probably debate the quality of, of the data set for uh, a few hours. But it will lead you to, um, you know, some sort of uh, uh, ranking um, of, pair of poor, fair, good, or very good, which leads to some sort of intervention along the way based upon its uh, a range of natural variability is what this is based upon. And so we can then, you know, one of the things that we're working on with Conservation Biology Institute and uh, Nick and uh, Open Standards World is a, is a pilot project and, and basically using this framework and mapping those across the landscape and, and putting it into these kind of management relevant bins uh, of, of categories. Uh, uh, this is, for example, the land fire data taken, uh, inter, uh, inter, intersected with that sage step conservation target and we can start to see that, oh yeah, maybe we should think about a different strategy here 
than up here. If we really want to prioritize, you know, protection, we probably want to protect the, the best available uh, and maybe have a different strategy in, in other places. So, um, you, know, I, you know, this is providing information and data that hopefully feeds into uh, later stages of the landscape conservation design. Um, so I, I, one of the things I wanted to make you aware of is the fact that there is a, an active effort uh, uh, led by Nick Salaski and the Foundations of Success to try to really articulate spatial uh, standards for, um, for using uh, spatial information and data within the, the open standards and using uh, their, the software program Marathi. And I think this, this holds some promise uh, for uh, landscape conservation design. I think you know, there's, there's other tools definitely out there, but this is one of them that uh, I just wanted to make you aware of. And I'm not going to read through each one of these, but these are our proposed methods or, or approaches that should be considered when looking at, uh, at uh, data and information. Another aspect, and this gets at that, uh, that LCD uh, attribute of um, future condition, is looking at threats or change agents, whatever you want to call it. Um, here across the top, uh, we have the conservation targets that we're looking at in the Northwest Basin and Range LCD and a suite of different uh, threats. And so we're able to, to rank and rate these. Um, one of the things that we're doing is developing standards. Uh, you know, how do we intersect the, those layers of our uh, uh, data layers of our conservation targets, for example, sage step or or sage grouse, and we start to intersect these with you know road densities or with uh, um, climate change models or um, some other uh, you know kind of data set that represents a, a conservation threat, and then have a standard way to map and show the the the, the true um, or get at the the true scope uh, severity and your reversibility of, of some of those threats. Um, another aspect is mapping strategies. And so this is what we've started to do in, uh, in, the, in this Northwest Basin and Range. We started this a, a few years ago. And uh, we've started to map um, you know, what people are doing on the landscape. And there's another uh, proposed standard that, the, that we're starting to, to develop there as well. So um, I guess I, I'd like to make the link between landscape conservation design and, and, da and data. It, you know, we talked about assessment of current condition with uh, the key ecological attributes, assessment of future condition with that threats assessment that we, we can do with the open standards, and then also getting at, at mapping strategies. Another aspect of landscape conservation design is, uh, is the identifica identification of priority areas or the spatial design. And, um, so coming back to the open standards world uh, where we've identified uh, uh, key ecological attributes, and this is a case study in that Columbia Plateau ecoregion. Uh, we've identified a suite of uh, key ecological attributes, things that we can map, um, indicators, and their, you know, their viability rank. And we've uh, identified what makes good uh, versus very good conditions. So this is kind of that condition assessment. So what we can do then is uh, transform these data uh, that represent these things on the landscape into uh, mappable conservation targets. And I, I should uh, point out that this was a process that was done very collaboratively. We had over 20 meetings uh, with uh, experts in the region to, to really articulate what is it that's important to map. Um, so for example, uh, you know, we identified that shrub step, sage step, is an important conservation target. Land covers our data to represent that. Uh, we're really interested in uh, patches, you know, kind of large intact blocks greater than 500 acres uh, of size. Um, they should have a good natural uh, buffer around there they, uh, and, you know, kind of getting at that concept of an uh, intact block. And there should be some adjacency to other patches, kind of getting that connectivity. So we basically took all of these, you know, uh, metrics that have been identified through that, that open standards process of identifying targets key ecological attributes, we're able to map those. And then from there, uh, we can develop a, 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 a prioritization of those places and those conditions that are important to people in the landscape. And again, like I said, we did this through uh, a very collaborative setting of uh, bringing people together. And that really brings, you know, I think another aspect of making data and information relevant and something that the open standards process really um, uh, brings to the to the forefront is 
this transparency of you know engaging people, having a transparent uh, framework that's easily understandable. So when we developed this map, this this blueprint, if you will, uh, it was readily uh, understandable by the people that were engaged, and people then could communicate that to their their managers and to other people in the landscape as well. So I think in terms of making data relevant for landscape conservation design, having a, a framework that's, that allows for transparency and a, a framework that allows for, for feedback and for people to uh, uh, um, you know, basically sit around those maps and identify what uh, makes a, a good uh, versus a, a poor versus a very good uh, aspect of the landscape that you want to be in your spatial design is is a really important part of, of it all. It shouldn't be done by an analyst, uh, you know, sitting in, a, in an office somewhere. It's a very uh, a collaborative uh, process that, that we engaged with. So, um, I, you know, what, what I hope to do in that little section there was uh, to make these links between, you know, these core aspects of landscape conservation design, assessment of current condition, assessment of future condition, identification of priority areas, and strategy mapping. And, and, and just let you know that there is a tool out there that we are that's being actively developed with the open standards to, to hopefully kind of bring these pieces together and, uh, and kind of make a cohesive uh, uh, framework that is, is, is readily understandable to, to multiple partners across the landscape. So um, I, hopefully I, I made that point. Uh, please ask questions uh, later if, if not. Um, now I'm going to kind of go into some technical barriers to making data relevant. And um, I, I should just uh, start by pointing out that there's several technical barriers. I don't have time to get into to all of them. Um, I'm going to deal with three in particular. Um, I'm not even going to go into data quality and uh, uh, what to do if you don't have data at all. Um, so I think that's where that, uh, that innovation part of the, of the LCD diagram really comes in handy. Um, so. Uh, you know, if there's too much uh, disparate data, I'm going to talk about uh, usefulness of models and um, and the issue of scale in landscape conservation design. Um, so, in the Northwest Basin Range, this is a project that you know probably faces a bit of an uncertain future, uh, and because of the, the, the occupation of the Malheur National Wildlife Refuge. Um, and uh, so there, it faced some, some, some bigger problems than data and information. So uh, data information, believe me, was just a small uh, issue in, in this geography. Um, but th there's still a, an active effort there to, 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 to build uh, uh, the foundations of a, of a landscape conservation design within a, within a sub-geography here. Um, so one of the things that we found going in and, you know, talking with our partners early on that um, landscape conservation design, is, there's, you know, there's a lot of different planning efforts out there. There's a lot of existing data around, you know, especially, especially around sage grouse, uh, the Western Governors Association, um, the, uh, uh, the state wildlife action plans, so a lot of different local efforts, just layer after layer of information and data out there. Um, they're not all targeted at the, at the whole landscape. Um, they're focused on, you know, a sub-geography or a particular um, species within that geography. How do we bring this all together? And uh, we actually, and I guess this is a, this is a concept that um, I, I feel is important in, in, in LCD, is this concept of synthesis and bringing together information in a way that, uh, that um, pays uh, some uh, respect to all the previous work that's been been happening in the region. Nothing's going to, you know, make people more uh, turned off on a LCD effort than, you know, recreating a wheel. So how do you, you know, not recreate a wheel, but how do you incorporate information to create a a a, a better or a, a wheel that looks at a, a larger uh, area or, or something like that? I don't, there's an analogy in there someplace. Um, so one of the things that we did, uh, kind of getting a synthesis, there's a lot of different uh, vegetation maps. I think there were about a dozen around small geographies, like the refuge system had their particular uh, vegetation map they really liked, and other people had their vegetation map. So we developed what we call uh, Franken-Veg. It's kind of the mixing together and, and mashing together of different vegetation sets to create one data set. I, th I think that was a positive thing that we did with data that uh, gets people uh, bought in to, to, the, to the data set. Another thing that we started, and you know, maybe this is what we do in the Pacific Northwest Coast, is first let's identify all of the uh, 
priority places that have been identified and, and let's have a discussion about strategies around this map. Does this, you know, does this overlay meet our goals and objectives to, uh, to identify strategies if that is indeed the, uh, the end point of, of LCD? Um, so yeah, I guess that's, uh, I guess that's one um, uh, thing to think about uh, uh, with that issue of a lot of disparate information and data. How can you stitch it together in a way that is, resonates with people on the landscape? Um, another uh, barrier is the usefulness of models. And this is something that I've struggled with uh, personally in, um, in a few different projects. Uh, you know, there's these great maps uh, that came out from the Fish and Wildlife Service in the, in the Great Lakes region looking at uh, uh, these density of, of duck pair maps. And people really said, boy, these are great maps for uh, driving conservation priorities and strategies. And then, you know, what I found is, is trying to develop those maps is, is a lot of work and a lot of effort. Um, and I so far haven't quite seen the, the return on that investment initially in landscape conservation design. It would be great if those maps existed, but I, um, I guess the caution is, does it really resonate with a whole effort? Um, uh, for example, this is a, 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 um, a diagram from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service showing the usefulness of, of models for species. And you know, it's not just species. It could be an uh, eco ecosystem service. It could be almost anything. Uh, any key ecological attribute or conservation target is probably going to run into this, uh, where you know the the usefulness is is low uh, when the cost is low, but you know the usefulness is potentially high when the cost is 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 very high. So there's this return on investment that is a little bit, and uh, I don't quite know if that's true or not, and I'd love to get people's inputs and insight on that. Um, I'm also finding that, and this is a, a, a slide that was presented that really resonated with me a, a few months ago, is that you, you know, getting to, to a product that people understand that's, that's relatively simple, um, has, has low uncertainty, and people understand is gonna have a higher return on investment than a very complex model. Uh, that is, uh, you know, it, it, it's a bit, it's hard to un, unravel and and um, and, uh, and really explain to people. And there's errors and there's assumptions and there's all these things. So at some point, I think in starting a landscape conservation design, maybe it's something that evolves over time. Is starting simple with with uh, with models it seems to be a, a, a pretty good uh, uh, practice. Unless you know the models exist and you can you can start. I guess I've just seen. Kind of this this case where you know the you were get uh, the 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 concept of data starts to and models starts to um, eclipse uh, the uh, the discussion and dialogue around strategies. You end up waiting a long time to get a model that that may may or may not work. Um, so that's that was a bit of a rant on on models. Um, uh, I think they have a role. It's just they need to be uh, really clearly defined. Um, another concept is. Uh, is scale, and so you know, people love these these blueprints, like I showed earlier with the with the uh, uh, Columbia Plateau. This is the, the blueprint that we developed there. This conservation priorities. Uh, these are the core areas, and then connectivity zones across the landscape that have been identified through a, this Mark Sand process that built off the open standards. Um, people love this, and it, it, it has value. But then people say, you know, we really need to know what to do within here, knowing that we can't. You know, we can't plan for all the diff all the uh, the sub geographies, all these priority places, but maybe there are some data sets or some some products that we can produce, some data driven products that will help people get at on the ground strategies. And so, what we did here uh, in collaboration with folks with the Arid Lands Initiative is develop um, what we call scorecards. So, for each one of these priority areas, we identified a, a, you know the contribution of that area to different targets some of the threats that are in there, uh, the amount of connectedness, uh, climate change related threats. And so people really like this kind of a, it's a complement to that broad uh, data and information that, that we're showing. Uh, it's, it's a way to kind of drill down into uh, strategies. And then we can also map that information across the landscape. And here we're actually mapping strategies uh, for restoration. We've also done this for protection, for fire, and for environmental change uh, uh, scenarios as well. So we're actually mapping where are the, the priority places for restoration versus protection versus, um, uh, versus fire-related strategies. 
And that's eventually where we want to get to, uh, to have those dialogues uh, with partners of the landscape. So um, I guess those were a, a few barriers and how we, uh, we have addressed them. Uh, and now I'm going to talk a little bit here about the, the uh, Pacific Northwest Coast. Uh, uh, here's the geography we've identified uh, as the, and this hash mark is, is this area we're looking at connectivity. Elsewhere, we're looking at watershed-based uh, uh, conservation planning efforts. Um, so we've identified the, the issue. We've identified fundamental objectives for the project. I'm not going to get into uh, uh, reading all of these. I encourage you to um, uh, potentially read the uh, uh, report, and I can give you a link to that later. Um, what we are uh, doing now is creating a, a timeline to get to uh, a blueprint, and we're doing uh, different versions of this blueprint. And I think this gets at this concept of you know, making information and data relevant by you know, not you know, waiting six years to develop the, the perfect plan with the perfect data and expect people are going to come along for the six years and, and be ready to incorporate that into their uh, strategies. You know, how do, we, how do we develop kind of a version 1.0 project? How do we do a quick assessment of targets, indicators, and threats? We do a spatial synthesis of overlapping priorities, kind of like what I showed with the basin and range. But really what we're interested in is getting to, you know, can we take this, this basic information and get at landscape strategies and have those di that dialogue s sooner than later? Um, and then in turn, I should have arrows going back, and that's going to feed into, you know, Hopefully, you know, the, the, the dialogue and the balance between strategies and data is going to feed into the dialogue about what, you know, what data needs to be uh, collected or, or analyzed next to really make a stronger blueprint and, uh, and continue along that route. So that's kind of the, the roadmap for, for us for making data uh, uh, and information relevant. We'll likely use uh, the open standards process, you know, whether yeah, how we communicate that with with uh, with partners is is going to be important. Um, there's a lot of you know kind of wonky uh, language uh, that we want to um, make sure that you know resonates with people as as we do that process. So we're we're actually right now uh, that's a that's uh, the major focus of what we're doing. Um, so anyway, I just uh, if if the Desert LCC and others are are thinking about uh, landscape conservation design, I'm just sharing kind of our our vision for making information and data relevant to this overall uh, goal of, of um, landscape strategies and implementation and getting that getting that conversation quicker than uh, than um, as quick as possible I should say um, so I guess I you know I'm, I'm almost at the end of my talk here uh, uh, this is a, a slide from Craig Groves uh, who's one of the gurus of landscape uh, conservation planning um, you know, he, he's, you know, one of his things is that, you know, there's a lot of uh, effort spent on making these spatial priority maps, but really that needs to be balanced with, um, you know, these theories of change and, and developing these, um, uh, you know, these strategies. You know, how are people actually going to use this information to get at something like, you know, landscape connectivity? How are people going to, you know, you know, how's the state and an NGO and federal agencies going to actually work together to, implement the design and having those conversations uh, balanced with, um, with uh, 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 the, the, the data side of things. And that's kind of what we're shooting for in the Pacific Northwest Coast as well, is kind of getting to a minimal, minimum viable data product, if you will, that will support the, this articulation of, of strategies. Um, I think the other thing, and then you know, hopefully this builds off of what you saw with Rua as well, is that I think making make beautiful products, make data relevant, make data uh, uh, you know uh, resonate with um, uh, an audience. I think that's the other really important thing. And how that happens is you know they have a, a the South Atlantic LCC developed a really nice blueprint and viewer that makes uh, makes their blueprint available um, in the Air Lands Initiative. We don't have that, but we still have. Some really great-looking maps, and uh, we have a, a, a committee that meets every once in a while and looks at those maps. Um, so, it, it, you know, there's no one way of, of doing anything uh, in in LCD, and that's where that innovation uh, part comes in. So, uh, lastly, some take-home messages: um, Don't let the pursuit of data get ahead of the process. You know, make sure that there's balance. Um, uh, you know, almost start with data minimalism. You know, what is the uh, you know, let's not collect and create a bunch of data that we don't need. 
uh, especially, uh, you know, be wary of getting into a, in developing a bunch of models that may not even play a role in, in strategy development. Um, focus on the end game, which is landscape scale strategies, and that data is a medium to get there. And there needs to be a structure and to get there, whether it's the open standards or whether it's, it's another, uh, there, but there does need to be some sort of, a, you know, thinking about the, you know, your, your vision, your goals, your targets, the data and information that represents those things, and the, the threats on the landscape as well, um, uh, we found open standards to be a, 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 a useful tool for that. And so uh, I, that's the, my last slide, just leaving you with the uh, data can't answer everything. It's, it's a, a mix of uh, uh, creative uh, left, left and right side brain thinking in a, in a LCD effort. And um, with that, I will stop and address any questions that, that people have. Thank you, Tom. That was a fantastic uh, presentation and uh, very insightful and useful information for um, the current and ongoing LCD efforts uh, throughout all the LCCs and, and uh, the regions. So we have time for questions now. And if you have a question, you can either raise your hand or, or type them in the chat box. Um, if you raise your hand, we will unmute you. Um, and Hello, this is Chris Lane from Crater Lake National Park. I don't know if anybody can hear me. Yes, we can. I can hear you. So I'm wondering, as we're, and this is kind of counter to what you're talking about with data overload, but has there been any work on taking stand level data? Because that's what we're working on an owl habitat model here at Crater Lake, and taking stand level data and integrating that into uh, a landscape level data set. Yeah, no, that's, uh, um, I, I have a lot of experience with vegetation mapping. Uh, if that's where you're getting at, you have data about forest stands and conditions, right. and structure, things like that. Uh, yeah, that's, um, you know, that kind of gets at this issue of, you know, you have data for that probably very important attribute. That's a key ecological attribute, right, is for structure. Sure. For a, a target. Do you, if you have information for that across the entire geography you're looking at, then I think you're, you're good to go. Um, you know, maybe there you would have to integrate that with other data sets. Like, I know if you're in Crater Lake, then you're probably familiar with the LEMP data set. Uh, the Pacific Northwest uh, Research Lab has developed, and um, yeah, so yeah, there's probably ways to use that in a in a in a useful way. I guess the, I would uh, just make sure that you know that is a management relevant data that will feed into the LCD later. Sure, but it would have to be consistent across the landscape, and that's what we don't have. We have great lidar data for for sand structure in certain places, but it seems like that would be, we'd have to do a lot of interpolation for, to get it across the landscape. And that's what I'm wondering is, we have isolated really good data for certain places, mainly in our fire areas. But, yeah, so it wouldn't, I mean, would it be feasible to take that and interpolate it across the landscape? Um. Uh, that's a, that that's a very technical. Question? Yeah, that's that's a very technical question. I think it is there. There, you might consider doing something like what we did and developing kind of this Franken data set of, uh, you know, we try to pull together the best available data for, uh, for example, for aspen woodlands. We have something very similar to you. Uh, we have uh, uh, really great data, field-based data on the refuges. We don't have great data elsewhere, but. We can, I think we still feel like we can use that data, and that would be useful to show the condition for Aspen stands across the landscape. And then where we don't have that data, it will be grayed out. And that serves two purposes. One is it will highlight you know, those places that we do know something, and second, it's going to highlight those data needs that we have in, in other places across the landscape. And hopefully that will lead to you know, maybe a strategy then is we need more data. And that will lead to a strategy that collaboratively people will uh, gather that data somehow. Sure. But 
I don't think it's hopeless. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Let's see if we have any other questions. Uh, you can also type them in the chat box or raise your hand uh, and we can unmute your microphone so you can talk and ask the question directly to Tom. Tom, I have one question myself. When you are, uh, uh, when, when, when you come up with uh, these uh, blueprints and uh, in order to improve the blueprint uh, from version one to version two when you uh, uh, would you be soliciting feedback uh, from a whole slew of uh, stakeholders and, and what are the mechanisms of obtaining and incorporating these feedback is it mostly through surveys or is it uh, you know, a combination of various um, other efforts, and what are those efforts, um, if, if any? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. That that would be a, would have been a great question for Rua, who's actually done this. But I, um, with their blueprint, they have started with a version 1.0. My understanding is that they had, uh, you know, they have a whole, you know, a couple staff that work with people to, you know, uh, you know, troubleshoot and think through what would make a good version 2.0 and get feedback. I think, you know, the, the whole purpose of versioning is to get feedback. Uh, you know, people do that when they create a, an app for your phone. Uh, they develop a, a, you know, a version 1.0 and then you get feedback, does it work, what doesn't work, where are the bugs, and then they make revisions based upon that. So that is, I think that's a central aspect of a uh, a versioning is, is getting feedback, and um, I would think that it would, uh, it, it would be through workshops um, that we get feedback, and uh, through, um, you know, I don't know if there would be a web-based uh, opportunity for people to provide feedback. I, I imagine there would. We just haven't got to that point yet. And do you see uh, some of those feedback mechanisms uh, uh, trends or being shared between uh, the LCCs going forward? Because uh, from what I gather, uh, South Atlantic is, is the first ever blueprint that has been developed, and I think uh, very soon many other blueprints are to follow. And so there will be a lot of uh, cross-pollination of those techniques, correct? Yeah, no, there's a, there's a community of practice within the these that learn from each other. Um, there's a whole suite of uh, recommended uh, practices that builds off of uh, the Campoloni, Campoloni et al. paper. Um, so yeah, I think uh, this is very much something that's a work in progress across the country, and uh, and yeah, we look forward to continuing that. Great. So, do we have any other questions here? Um, any other comments? Uh, feel free to use the chat box, or you may even speak up, as most of you are unmuted. As a reminder, this webinar was recorded and it will be made available uh, on our YouTube channel. Um, so I guess we don't see any more questions, uh, but I just want to say thank you very much, Tom, uh, for, for, for this talk. I think it was a fantastic talk and it will be a fantastic resource going forward to, to look back upon. Um, and you can uh, the, the the webinar will be posted on our Desert LCC YouTube channel, and thank you all for participating. Uh, you can access our YouTube channel by just googling Desert LCC YouTube. And um, once again, thank you, Tom, and thank you, everyone, and um, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.